Hello everyone. Today's language is called Jig, and Jig is one of uh, the special languages of this semester in that we're not going to add any new surface features to the language. Jig is one of the languages where, from the user's perspective, it's going to be incredibly similar to our previous language, Iniquity, except we're going to do something to the implementation so that more programs work correctly. And I'm going to put correctly in quotes for a reason I'll describe in just a minute. Jig is about tail calls. And tail calls are a type of function call that we can support as iteration. And what I mean by that is the way we implemented function calls in Iniquity, we had to put things on the stack, we had to arrange things in a certain way, then we used the call instruction and the call instruction does stuff with the stack pointer. And then to come back, we use the return instruction, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all this big hoopla about calling a function. But sometimes we just want to jump to the function. So what's an example of a time we'll want to jump to the function we're calling? Well, the most famous use case where this really makes an impact is in recursive functions. So let's say you have a function, for example, factorial, that calls itself. Now, in Iniquity, every time it calls itself, it's pushing stuff on the stack, arranging stuff, calling the call instruction, that also pushes something on the stack, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter what, when you make the call, you're using more memory because the stack is just in memory. Now, taking this to the limit, you can run out of memory because you keep using more stack as you call more and more functions. Now, this in many systems results in what you've probably heard, a stack overflow. That's when your stack gets so big that the operating system is like, no, I'm not gonna let you continue doing this. I don't know what you're up to, just stop it. So stack overflows are undesirable because there's no reason that the user should be limited from calling more functions. We said we like functions, right? They allow programmers to abstract a block of code so that they can reuse it, et cetera, et cetera. So functions are great. And now we're being told, whoa, whoa, if you use too many though, that's a problem. So how do tail calls prevent this? Well, in tail calls, what we look for is opportunities to reuse the space on the stack we've already been using. We're gonna talk about how we can identify those opportunities, but in short, it's when we're not gonna need any of the variables again. So if we can see statically by looking at the program that, oh, when I call this function, I'm not gonna need any of the variables I've already had. So I can just reuse that space on the stack, put the arguments to the function in that space, overriding what's currently there and then jump to the function instead of using the call instruction because jumping doesn't add anything to the stack. Jump just jumps to an address. Now, what about the return thing? Well, that's kind of cool because in these uh, opportunities we've identified, what we're really saying is when we return from where we're going to call, we're going to call another return again. So in some sense, we squash that down to a single return to where we're called. That might seem a bit hazy, but I'll explain in a minute. So tail call, you may have heard the term tail call optimization. Uh, in the programming languages community, it's a bit of a small controversy over whether this should even be called an optimization because you should be able to call functions. And so having them work in more cases is not an optimization, that's just more correct. I definitely empathize with that viewpoint, and I personally like to work in languages where I can call as many functions as I want and not have to worry about stack overflows uh, unless I'm doing something uh, a little bizarre. But, uh, you know, that's, like I said, that's a little bit of a controversy because many languages don't support uh, tail calls in this way for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is you lose stack information. So when you have a stack trace, from an exception uh, that can be useful in debugging, but using tail calls eliminates that. So as with most things, there are trade-offs. That being said, it's very important in functional languages 
or languages that take functions very, very seriously because we want to uh, describe iteration via functions, right? So uh, we don't need loops in a functional language because we can just write a recursive function and then thanks to tail calls, that just becomes a loop in our assembly, uh, even though we've written it in this kind of higher level way of calling functions. So no new syntactic features, no changes to the AST. Today's all about changing the way we do function calls in certain cases. Let's get to work. As mentioned in the introduction, we don't have any changes to our AST or to the surface language. So let's instead think about what do I mean by a tail call? How could we identify a tail call? So if we're going to ask the compiler to identify something for us, we should at least be able to explain it, right? So I have an example here, as usual, example.racket, and I've defined some functions. And I have the identity function, pretty straightforward. I have this function f that doubles something. And then I have this function sum. And sum takes some accumulator and a number. And if the number is zero, we return the accumulator. And if the number is not zero, then we add that number to the accumulator, subtract one from the number and call sum again. So as you can see, this is kind of defining a loop. And what it's going to do is take some number, uh, subtract one on each iteration and add that to the accumulator. So if you start the accumulator with zero, you're going to get the sum of that number and every number between that number and zero. Great, fantastic. So in iniquity, if we wrote a function like this and passed a big enough number, the operating system would get mad at us and it would say stack overflow. You're allocating too much space on the stack. You can't do this. And this actually sets a lot of expectations on the programmer. And this is why you see a lot of programmers shying away from defining functions recursively, et cetera, et cetera, because you don't want the operating system to kill your program because one input caused your program to use too much stack space. That's just not what you're going for. So instead, we use for loops or while loops that make it much clearer that an iteration is happening, even if that means managing some state and doing some other stuff that we don't want to have to think about when we write our programs. So even though this isn't a surface change, you could have written this program in iniquity. We are getting uh, more programs to work, right? Fewer programs will be killed by the operating system. Not, uh, you know, there's still going to be programs where you can call stack overflows and we'll, we'll explain how that might look, but more programs are going to work as they, as they should. So what makes this a tail call? It's not the fact that we call sum. In fact, I could rewrite this in a way where we wouldn't get that, be um, that benefit of iteration. Um, and, and I'll do that in a second to demonstrate, but the name in tail call, the tail part is a hint. And the idea is a function call is a tail call or in the tail position when it is the last thing you're going to do in an, in an expression. So here, calling sum is the last thing we're going to do. If we were to come back here, right, if we called sum in the traditional way like we did in iniquity, and we return back here, well, what are we gonna do? We're just gonna immediately return again, right? We're done, there's nothing else to do. And so when there's nothing else to do and you call a function, that's considered a tail call. It's at the end, the, the tail end uh, of, of your expression. So let's, uh, you know, just down here, I'm going to write some other programs, uh, examples below of things that are in a tail call. So one way to think about is uh, tail call is actually kind of like a context of an expression. And so let's just assume we'll, we'll, we'll write it like this. We can say tail call of some expression like this. So uh, if something's a tail call, let's pick apart what sub expressions may be a tail call. So if a let is a tail call, 
uh, x is, you know, this doesn't matter what it is. So uh, this could be e1 and this is e2, right? Which, which sub expressions of the let are themselves in a tail position? Well, uh, is e1, when we execute the code for e1, is that the last thing that we're gonna do in this let? No, it's not. So when we compile e1, it's no longer in a tail call context. But e2 is the last thing we're gonna do. Regardless of what e2 is, it's the last thing we're gonna do when we execute the code for this let. So that means uh, in this context, or sorry, for, for that context, we have e1 is not uh, tail tail call position and e2 is tail call position fantastic all right now we can go through everything in our ast and figure out how does how does that how does that work we can do the same line of reasoning so i'm not going to do that here actually let me just uh, let me just get rid of this really quick and let's actually go to our ast file itself and actually think about what's going on here. So for each node in our AST, we can think about, okay, well, if EOF is in a tail call position, it has no sub expressions. So EOF is a tail call. That doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna compile it any differently. That's not what we're answering now. Right now, we're just answering the question, how can we know when something's in a tail call position? And we're assuming right now that the, the expression of the AST node is, and we're deciding how can we divide that amongst its sub expressions. So same with empty, there's no sub expressions. And what you're gonna see is for everything that there is no sub expressions, okay, well then that's pretty straightforward. So that gets us all the way to, from EOF to prim zero. There's no sub expressions, so it's not really that interesting of a question. Okay, but prim one does have sub expressions and namely it has uh, an argument. So when we call a primitive, is the argument the last thing we're going to do? No, calling the primitive is the last thing we're gonna do. So whatever computation we do for the argument is not the last thing we're gonna do. Okay, so that doesn't uh, you know, transfer down to its sub-expressions. Same logic for uh, prim2. Now if gets interesting, so let's do the same thing we did before. So let's say um, we have some expression, we'll, we'll say it's in a tail call, and we have if, and the way the if expression goes is we have some predicate, we have the true branch, and we have the false branch. So if the if is in a tail position, that means we're in some expression, and the if is the last thing we're gonna do in this expression. How does that transfer to ifs sub expressions? Well, is the predicate the last thing we're going to do? No, because we have to compute the predicate and then branch to one of the branches. So the predicate is not the last thing we're gonna do. Is the true branch the last thing we're gonna do? Well, kind of. If the predicate's true, then the true branch will be the last thing we're gonna do. And then with the false branch, it's the same logic just inverted. If the predicate is false, then false is going to be the last thing we're going to do. So the the if one's a little bit tricky to think about because it's not that we're going to do it, but if we do the true branch, it is the last thing we're going to do in this expression, right? We're not worrying about the wider context that this if happens in. What we're asking is if we're doing this if, is that true branch the last thing we're gonna do? Well, and the answer is, if we execute the true branch, then it is the last thing we're gonna do. So then what that means is both the true branch and the false branch are both in a tail position if the if is in a tail position. I know I'm using my hands here, gesticulating. We're gonna make this into code and make it really concrete in just a second. Uh, begin is the, the easiest one that has multiple expressions because begin, if you'll remember, has the uh, meaning where we say begin and we have E1 and E2 and begin works as it does the code for E1 and then it does the code for E2. So 
just by its nature, is E1 the last thing it's going to do? No, because the idea is it does E1 and then it does E2. So is E2 the last thing we're going to do? Yes. So for begin, E1 is not in a tail position, but E2 is in a tail position. Okay. Let we already talked about. Var does not have sub-expressions. And then applications, uh, it's similar to the logic of the primitive, where if the application is in a tail position, then the last thing we do is call the function. Or in the case of how we're going to implement tail calls, the last thing we'll do is jump. But the arguments themselves are not the last thing we do, because we have to do those, save those results somewhere, usually on the stack, and then we call the function, right? So the fact that we say and then means it's not the last thing we do. Okay. So looking at compile.racket, we've rearranged things in order to do this tail call stuff a little more efficiently. And in particular, compile e now takes another argument. So it takes the expression we're trying to compile as before. It takes the initial compile time environment as before, and now it also takes a Boolean flag that says, are we in a tail position or not? And so we start off the top context of our whole pro program is indeed in a tail position. So now if we go to compile E, um, we now see that it takes this extra Boolean flag, you know, tha for tail. Um, and as we discussed when looking at the AST, for int, we don't have to do anything different. For bool, we don't have to do anything different. For all of these, we don't have to do anything different. Things start getting interesting at if, begin, let, and app. And so for all of these, now their respective compile functions, compile if, compile begin, compile let, compile app, also take a flag that say whether this if, begin, let, or app is in a tail position. So app is really the, the super interesting one. So we're going to look at that one first. Let's look at compile app. And here we can see that compile app takes the function we want to call, the list of arguments, the compile time environment, and the flag that says whether we're in a tail call. And now we just dispatch on that flag. We say, if we're in a tail call, then we'll compile app tail. How's that work? We don't know yet. We'll see in the video. And if it's not in a tail call, we do compile app non-tail, which is actually the compile app from iniquity. There's no difference there. Um, so it's just the compile app tail. That's a new thing here. And we use the compile app tail if we can determine that we are indeed in a tail call. So let's look at implementing that. So first let's, as per usual, start drawing my uh, memory diagram here. Oh, max RAM. And we have a few uh, registers that are of interest, in particular RSP, we're going to be pointing uh, at the at the stack somewhere. Okay, we don't know what's here. So, um, the idea here is we want to save or reuse the stack space of the function we're currently in. So, if you remember with compile app non tail, the way it worked is we um, load uh, the effective address of R, which is kind of our return, where we want to return, right? That's the label down here. So we load that address and we push it on the stack. So somewhere on the stack, we're going to have um, uh, the uh, program counter that we're going to return to. And then we say compile ease. So for each argument in our function, that's going on the stack. So it might be, you know, argument one, argument two, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when we do a tail call, we don't want to add to the stack. We don't want to add the new PC here, the new argument here. That's using more stack. And the whole point is we want to uh, 
avoid adding to the stack in that way. We don't want to cause a potential stack overflow. So instead, what we're going to do is we want to figure out, well, once we don't need these anymore, we can get rid of them and reuse that stack space. So that's the goal. We want to reuse this stack space. So let's take it one step at a time. We can't just get rid of them right now when we're doing the tail call itself because we might use those values in computing the arguments for the function we're about to call. So let's start off easy. So the first thing we have to do for sure is we need to uh, compile the arguments of the function we want to call. So the first thing we'll do is compile ease. We have this list of arguments, ease, and it's in that same compile time environment. So this is going to push our new arguments. So these are the arguments for the function we're in, a1, a2, and for the function we're about to call, I'll call it e1, e2, right? So here we will, um, actually, I think the way this works is it'll, you know, e1 will go there and e2 will go there. And actually, let me really quickly look something up. Uh, I don't think you can see me doing this. Yeah, you still see the code. I just want to quickly look something up um, to see if the push in x86 uh, keeps the... Uh, it's pointing at the thing. So let me see. It decrements then stores it. So yeah, so it'll look like this. So after we push the last argument, the stack pointer will be pointing at e2. Okay, so it's I was correct on how we did it. All right, and so now, uh, great. We now have the arguments for the function we want to call. So let's be really concrete. Let's say we were in some function and in the tail position, we say, you know, call f with e1, e2. So now we've put e1, e2 on the stack. Great, fine, no problem. Um, but our whole thing is we want to reuse uh, we want to reuse the stack. So we don't have this functionality right now, but basically we want to shift E1 to where A1 was and then shift E2 to where A2 was. So we could call that a bunch of things. What we're going to call it in this class is move args. And the idea here is move args is going to be a function and it's going to tell us how many things do we want to move um, and how big is our uh, stack? So how many things do we want to move? Well, that's the length of ease, right? That's how many things we want to move the number of arguments we have. And how big is our stack? Well, that's the length of C. Okay, so we now, we now have another to do. Let me do that, define, uh, move args, and that's, uh, we're gonna say this many things by this amount, by some offset. And we have a to-do, okay. So then what we're gonna do, so we do that, we put that here. Oh, that was horrible. There we go. That was uh, not any better. And then we're gonna do E2 here. And so now we have reused the stack space. We don't know how this works yet, but that's okay, we're gonna keep moving. Um, then when we pushed all the arguments, oh, hold on, there was one more here because we had E1, E2, and then A1, A2. Uh, when we pushed all the arguments, the stack pointer is still pointing over here. So technically E2 will still be there. We'll just copy them over. And so as long as the stack pointer is pointing there, we haven't actually reused the stack space. So what we need to do is increment the stack pointer so that we are back to where we want it to be. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add, oh, add to, oh my gosh, I can't type, add to RSP um, eight times the length of C, which is our current uh, stack depth. Okay, because that was the uh, number of things we had on the stack before we did all the arguments. Now you may say, why is it the number of things we had on the stack before and not the number of arguments? Um, because we, uh, when we did two and two, it was kind of hard to see. So let me show you an example where it's not the same. 
So, yeah, I should have done like two and three. So let's say originally our stack was a one, a two, a three, and then we'll do e1, e2. Okay, so we want to move e1 uh, uh, three positions over, right? One, two, three. So we'll copy e1 there. Then we want to move e2 three positions over, one, two, three, and then we'll put e2 there. And now we don't want the stack pointer to point uh, two down, that would just be there. We want it to point three down because it was the number of things we used to have on the stack. That's how much space we're saving, right? So uh, I think that's clearer when I did the two and three. So we'll add the number of things we used to have on the stack to RSP, great. And then what do we do? Well, we now have a stack where we have the program counter where it's expected at the bottom or at the base of the stack. Then we have our arguments with the stack pointer pointing to the top of our arguments. Well, what's left to do? Now we just need to call the function. But remember, we don't want to use a call instruction or do all the stuff we had to do last time with saving the address on the stack. The whole point is we want to avoid that. So now we just say jump. And where we're going to jump, it's going to be symbol to label uh, for f. And let me close all the things. And that is the code for tail calls. It's actually simpler than the code for normal function calls. The only cost, the only downside, is that it's not always appropriate. If we're not in a tail position, we can't just clobber the stack the way we did. We can only do this when we know we're not going to use those stack, uh, those things on the stack anymore. So that's the tail call itself. Now we need to actually implement move args. I kind of used it in this diagram, but now we need to implement it. So let's think about what we want for move args. So we want to move this number of things this many places. That's the idea here. So we're going to have to do some matching on i, right? So let's think. We can use cond. And we can say, you know, zero ha huh, um, of offset, right? If, if, if the offset itself is zero, then there's nothing to do, right? If we don't want to move, even if we want to move five things zero places, we're done. If we want to move a million things zero places, we're done, right? So, okay, that's um, nice. Although I'm using this syntax wrong, hold on. Yes. Uh, Yeah, that is that, and then sequence, and now it's the close square. Okay, and the other thing we want to check is if we don't want to move any number of things, right? If i is zero, then we are done. It doesn't matter how many places we want to move it. If we want to move zero things, we're done. Okay, great. And so now there's only one case left we actually have to worry about. Uh, actually, we don't need a condition. It's just the else, right? So in, when anything else is true here. Uh, let me get rid of this to do that's distracting. And so here, we're going to have a sequence of instructions. And what is it we were doing? We were taking um, something that was on the stack. So remember, originally, like RSP looked there, this was a one, a two, a three, and we wanted to move uh, e one down the stack three positions. So why wouldn't we start with e2? Well, because what if we have more arguments than the number of positions we're going to move it? Uh, then we would clobber other arguments, right? If we only wanted to move e2 one slot, we would clobber e1, uh, which would be bad. So we definitely want to move um, the, the first argument first so that we don't clobber it. Okay, so let's think about how we want to do this. We're definitely going to use the move instruction, and we're probably going to need some sort of scratch register. So I'm going to use um, R8 here, and we're going to say it's going to be some offset of RSP. And the question is, what offset of RSP? Well, um, uh, that's what I is telling us, right? It's the number of things 
uh, we want to move. So if we want to move two things, we're going to start with the first offset. If we want to move one thing, we're going to start with the zeroth offset. So actually the offset from RSP is going to be eight times sub one of I, I believe. Does this make sense? So we're going to, let me take this down here. And so here we have R8. And so if we move the offset, that's eight times sub one of I, in this case, I is two. So the offset of one, that's this. And we're going to copy that into R8. So R8 will equal E1. Okay, cool. And now we want to replace A1 with E1. And so we have to think about that. Uh, oh, so that's going to be another move. Move. Uh, and then we'll have to think about what the offset will be, but then we want R8. We want to move the thing that's in R8 there. So what is it? In this case, it's one two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I think we have to add, hmm, it's the three from the offset, so we're gonna have to add offset to it, but then it's the sub one of i plus that, no, that's not right because no, maybe, maybe that is right. So if we do sub one of i, that would be one, and then add it to three, which is the offset, that would give us the four. And then when we're moving this, i will be um, one, sub one of i will be zero, and the offset will be three, and then it'll be one, two, three. Okay. So that's a little complicated, but we'll get through it. So we want to offset RSP by eight times. Let me get my brackets right here. Okay. Eight times, we're gonna add sub one of I to, what was it I said? The offset. Oh, that's not it. Okay, so now we move what's in R8 here, uh, E1. Okay, and then we're not done. Now we need to do it again, but we decrement I, right? We're gonna do that until there's no more things to copy over to move. So now we're gonna say move args sub one i off. And I think that's good. If you don't mind, because I'm a little shaky here, I wanna work through an example. So, yeah, let's say we call move args move args on two, that's the number of things we want to move, by three. Actually, let's do something different. Let's do uh, two by one. Let's change it up. So let's make sure that works. Um, so this will be A. So there was one argument originally on the stack. We have two arguments for the function we're going to call, and we want to move those two things one slot over. Okay, so let's start. So we call two one, this is not zero, we don't do this, this is not zero, we don't do this. And so here we say, okay, we're gonna move into R8, the offset of RSP, eight times uh, sub one of two. So this will be eight, offset of RSP, that's E1. And we move that into R8, great. 
and then we say move from R8, offset of RSP, and then this will be one again, oh, one again, and the offset's one. So one plus one is two. Yeah, so we're offsetting RSP by two and we're putting R8 there. So let's see, one, two, and what's R8? It's E1. So we do that, okay, and we've successfully clobbered A1 with E1. And then we say move args sub one of I, I was two. So now we're calling move args of one, one. Uh, this is not true, this is not true. And so now we say move into R8, the offset of RSP. It's eight times sub one of I, I is one, sub one is zero. So this is zero. So we're just moving what's in the offset of RSP to R8 and the offset of RSP is E2 and we move that into R8. So now we have E2 in R8. And then we say move whatever's in R8 into uh, the offset of RSP by this much, which sub one of I will be zero again, but then offset is one. So we're going to offset RSP by eight, which is one slot over and copy what's in R8 there. So R8 is E2, beautiful. And then when we call move args again, we sub one of I. So now it's move args of zero, one. This is not true, but this is. And so we have the last, you know, just sequence empty, no instructions to do. And so we have moved that. And then after we call move args, we would say, add RSP eight times length of C. Well, in this case, C, the length of C was one. And so we would add eight, that would point there. And we have successfully uh, reused the space of our uh, stack. So there you go. So that's how tail calls works. But really quick, I mentioned earlier, where is it? That's not the only thing that took tail calls into account. So let's look at those. Uh, compile if, what are we doing? Well, notice here, we're just saying, okay, it takes all the arguments it took before, and now it takes this Boolean, are we in a tail call? But notice it doesn't actually dispatch on that. It just says compile the sub expressions for true and false with the same thing. So if, if this was true here, then when we call this compile E, it will be true. And when we call this compile E, it will be true. But notice, no matter what this T is, this T, huh? When we compile the E1, which is the conditional, it's false. We're saying it's definitely not tail call when we compile E1. So that's all we're doing with if. If you remember when we showed that different sub expressions could possibly be in a tail position, right? If the if is in a tail position, then the true and false branches are in tail positions. If the if is not in a tail position, then the true and false branches are also not in tail position. But no matter what, the condition of an if is not in a tail position. So we're not actually dispatching on the fact that it's a tail position or not. We're just propagating that information where it might be useful. Okay, what about compile begin? Well, here we see a similar thing. No matter what, the first expression, E1, is not in a tail position, so we say false. And the second expression, well, if we were in a tail position for the whole begin, then we're in a tail position for the second expression of a begin. With let, again, similar logic. For E1, the, the definition of our binding, we're never in a tail position. We're not done yet. But for the body, we're in a tail position if and only if the whole let is in a tail position. So only compile app dispatches on T. It's the only one that actually does anything differently if we're in a tail position. Everything else is about propagating the information to say, where are we in a tail position or not? All right, so that's tail calls. Uh, one of the things that's gonna make functional languages uh, really useful because now we can write these nice recursive functions and not worry about stack overflows just because um, 
you know, the stack is getting used by the nature of a function call. All right, thanks for your time.